Welcome back to Better Than Before. It's time for our leadership and business lesson today. And I want to talk to you about priorities and decision making. I thought I would go over how to develop your priority based decision making. So I've broken it down into three components and then some individual items under each of the three major components. The first thing is what is a priority? You may not realize this, but priority means one. It doesn't mean many. When someone tells me I have many priorities, I always think you don't have any priorities. You got a bunch of stuff that you think might be important. Number one is decide on the important, not the convenient. Just like you got to be diligent and have the right kind of insight to ensure you're not working on yesterday's priorities, it takes a lot of practice to get this right, to learn how to set those rock solid, really important items that we call priorities. And one of the biggest challenges for leaders is accurately prioritizing work that's really going to matter over the next several weeks, months, quarters, and over the year. And have that track back to them, what you can do on a daily basis to achieve some of that. And you don't want to fall into the role of playing top priority for every other thing that comes down the pike. Your priorities are just that. They are single, very big issue items that don't really change all that much. And to help manage your priorities and hit some deadlines, here's some six steps that you can take to prioritization. The first thing I would do is make a big brain dump list. So everything that you think might be important, not necessarily urgent, not necessarily convenient, but important, just dump them all down on a big old list. The second step is identify urgent versus important. If you have any items that need immediate intention, if you have things that can be knocked out very quickly, they're probably not priorities that you need to work on over a, a week or a month or a quarter or a year. If they're very urgent, go ahead and just knock them out, cross them off and get them out of the way, right? I'm talking about items that if you don't get them completed by the end of the day or in the next several hours, they're going to have serious negative consequences. You're going to miss a client deadline. You're going to miss a publication deadline or when something's supposed to be done at a certain time. Those are things that are urgent. Just go ahead and take care of them. Check to see if there are any high priority dependencies that rely on you finishing up a piece of work right now. Get those out of the way. Then go back and over the remaining things in your list, start assessing value for each of the items. Look at your important items and identify what carries the highest value and return to you, your business, and organization. As a general practice, you want to recognize exactly which types of tasks have top priority over others. For example, focus on client projects. Uh, maybe over work that you're doing internally in the company. Another way to assess value is to look at how many people are going to be impacted by this item. In general, the more people that are involved or impacted, the higher the value of the priority. Number four step, put them in order according to difficulty. Now, this is one of the most challenged things in my coaching. I want you to start with the one that's going to take the most effort. So whatever you think is going to take the most effort to get finished, that's the one I want you to start on. Productivity experts suggest that the tactic of starting with the lengthier task first, but if you feel like you can't focus on your meatier projects before you finish up the shorter task, go with your gut and do that. It can be motivating to check a small task off the list before diving into deeper waters, but we talked about that, right? If you can get them done quickly, Go ahead and get those done. But once you have your list kind of in order, the one that's the hardest, that's the one I'd put at the top of the list. Step number five, be flexible. Uncertainty and change, they're a given. Know that your priorities will change and often. But here's the trick. You want to stay focused on the tasks you're committed to completing. Don't add to and don't subtract from Get your list down to a point where this is the list, and I'm not modifying my list unless some unusual circumstance comes up. This is my list. It's not going to change one way or the other 
This is what I'm going to get done this day, this week, this month, this quarter, this year. And finally, step number six is know when to throw out. Most people, when they make out their list, they're not going to get to everything on it. After you prioritize all these things and you look at your estimates, cut the remaining stuff out and focus on the priorities that you know you must and can complete. Then take a deep breath and dive in and get some stuff done. I usually think that five things, if you can do five really important needle moving priorities per day, that's pretty awesome. If you did 25 very important things that make a huge difference to your company per week, you're walking in tall cotton. Make sure you know what to keep, what to throw out. So sometimes doing a stop doing list helps. So you know, hey, I just need to pitch this out. This doesn't fit. Maybe we'll get to this another time. But right now it's not in my focus. Number two pillar, priority decisions require deep thinking. And I've been talking to you in previous podcasts about having this strategic time to yourself to do some heavy-duty thinking and think about things that you want to accomplish. And we've talked about how you can utilize that time. We've talked about cleansing your life. We've talked about cleaning up your relationships. We've talked about educating yourself. And we still have more that we're going to give you as suggestions on how to use that strategic time. But here is a great place to do it also. It gives you a chance to do some deep thinking about your priorities. If you're easily distracted and unable to focus, You need some time to think, and the way we think can make or break us. Quality thoughts create supportive beliefs, and all our behaviors are directly connected to our beliefs. We do not engage in behaviors that we don't believe in first. Negative and unbeneficial thought processes can make us more likely to give up when the going gets tough. It's time to change all that thinking for the better and introduce some deep thinking into our lives and into our careers. Deep thinking requires effort and patience. On one hand, effort is necessary to learn the fine art of thinking deeply. And on the other hand, effort is required to maintain your focus on one particular train of thought. If you're easily distracted, if you get off your train of thought very easily, this might be more difficult for you, but not impossible. It's just like learning how to work out at the gym or lift weights. It's going to take a little bit to begin. And before you know it, you'll be into a routine and you'll be doing heavy lifting as far as deep thinking is concerned. Some people have great difficulty with it, right? Especially in times of increasing attention deficits and tempting distractions and smartphones and Facebook and Twitter. And so it takes a lot of mental strength to refocus whenever you start to lose focus. The other thing is it takes a lot of energy when you're you're not sleeping well or when you're tired, you're more easily distracted than when you have a large supply of energy that you can stave off those uh, temptations to get unfocused. Thinking deeply is, if we were to define it, is the progress of gradually increasing the quality and depths of your thinking. And we can accomplish this by diligently replacing inferior and shallow thinking with more qualitative and supportive thinking. But deep thinking is not just about replacing your thinking. It's about entertaining thoughts of a higher quality and exploring where these thoughts can take you. Deep thinking helps you to specifically focus your attention on a particular thought or idea instead of being constantly distracted by irrelevant thoughts that lead you nowhere. Thinking deeply can aid you in blocking those thoughts off. And when you do that, a higher level of mindfulness is promoted, which is going to help you entertain quality thoughts for a longer period of time. And there's a lot of benefits to doing this. One of them is that thinking deeply promotes a higher level of independence of thought. And we all like to think that we're independent thinkers, right? We don't like to think that anything controls us. But unfortunately, undisciplined thinking can control us just like disciplined thinking can. In the age of information overload, a depth of thinking is less and less valued by everybody. 
The number of people addicted to various kinds of distractions is rapidly increasing. In a lot of people's lives, there's no longer a mental and physical space that's not penetrated by technology. Smartphones keep us connected to the internet wherever we go, whatever we do. And as a result, the switch from being active, working, chatting, playing, watching, to a more passive state of thinking and reflecting and having this strategic time to ourselves does not occur. The craving for information makes it incredibly difficult to actually experience the magnificent joy of solitude and a deeper level of thought. Instead of seeking answers to our questions within, we've grown used to just seeking answers on Wikipedia or Google. After all, it's a lot easier to do that with your question instead of thinking and reflecting on it. The problem is certain questions cannot be answered in this manner, and the process of thinking deeply can be divided into three different parts. I figured you're going to ask me, how do I think deeply? Well, number one, you got to have the right environment. Highly distractive and noisy environments do not promote deep thinking. Therefore, it's important to find a peaceful and comfortable spot where there's no distractions. Choose an area where you can let your thoughts unfold freely. Your nearest park or nature in general is great. Your own room is just fine, just wherever you're not going to be interrupted for a certain amount of time. Number two, cut out the distractions. Distractions prevent you from concentrating on quality, and they keep you from ever reaching a deeper level of thinking. It is therefore immensely important. Are you listening? It's therefore immensely important to reduce the impact distractions have on your mind. If you eliminate distractions from your environment and your mind, you create more space for deep thinking. Some distractions can be easily removed, such as your smartphone, which you can lock away or turn off. Other distractions are more difficult to control as they require a certain level of mental strength. This is the case with surfing on the Internet. It's going to take a little discipline to seek only what you need on the Internet without getting distracted. Mental distractions retain our thinking processes on the surface level, which prevents us from ever exploring the depths of our minds. While most people understand that television and technology gadgets distract us, they neglect that there are other distractions that are just as destructive. Basically, Everything that doesn't encourage your own individual deep thinking can be a distraction. Every piece of information we simply pick up without thinking about it is a meaningless distraction. You ever know those people when you walk by their computer and you look at their internet browser and there are 16 tabs open? Well, they started on one tab And then they opened a new window and another new window and another new window and another new window and they're down 22 rabbit holes. That's what I'm talking about. Number three step to deep thinking is practice builds your concentration muscle. Removing distractions from your life provides an important fundamental item for deep thinking. This alone is not enough. It is important to build upon the fundamental strong framework by learning to concentrate which is going to help you cultivate deep thinking. Without being able to concentrate yourself, you're going to lose focus. Concentration helps you maintain your focus on a specific thought or idea without allowing mediocre or irrelevant thoughts to interfere. What if you made that a goal for 2019? I'm not going to think irrelevant or mediocre thoughts. Sounds painful to me. Concentration is difficult to come by, so you're going to have to work at it. You can't simply will yourself to be more concentrated. You can't just sit there and say, I will concentrate more, I will concentrate more, I will concentrate more. Concentration must be developed. It takes practice, dedication, and effort to increase and develop your concentration muscle. So the three pieces to deep thinking is Create the right environment, cut out the distractions, and practice building your concentration muscle. We've learned how to set priorities. We've talked about introducing deep thinking in at number two. And number three is just a proverb I want to share with you. Successful people make decisions quickly and change them rarely, where unsuccessful people make decisions slowly and change them often. 
Many times we call them wafflers. They waffle back and forth. And it takes forever to decide. And they change and they modify and they change and they modify and they change and they modify. Whereas some people just like, okay, that's my decision. Let's go with it very quickly and rarely change. So there are a couple of items I want to share with you on this. Number one, set your priorities. And if you've got more than five, you've got too many, right? Number two, get your thinking right. We talked about that. How to increase your time of developing your mind and disciplining it to do some really good thinking. Number three, get a realization of control. It's important to focus on what's in your control. When you get distracted worrying about things that are outside your control, it's going to drive you nuts. It's going to create delays. It's going to cause you to waffle. The more you focus on what you can control, the quicker you will be at making decisions. Number four, get to the point where you can understand pattern recognition. Most of what we face every single day is similar to other scenarios we've already experienced sometime in our life. By understanding this, it's possible to quickly map a range of previous experiences and their outcomes. Leverage those pattern recognitions to arrive at the most viable decision. Over time, as you make decisions, speed and quality will improve. Where you begin to recognize this looks like that. And if this looks like that, this must be the answer, right? Number five, put a time limit on yourself. Oh my God, this is a big problem for a lot of people. They just refuse to do a self-imposed deadline. Your brain automatically works faster when it has limited time, not unlimited time. So when you tell your brain to organize itself quickly and efficiently, and it only has 15 minutes to do it, it will get to working. It may hurt a little at first, but it will develop, grow, and adjust if you don't let your brain off the hook. I've done exercise after exercise in workshops with participants where I've proven time and time again, I give them 10 minutes to make a list of 50 things. And man, they go to work on it because they only got 10 minutes. And you'd be amazed at what people can come up with in 10 minutes when they know there's only 10 minutes. But if you said, hey, over the next three or four days, whenever you have time, maybe you could come up with a list for me, that person's going to come up with it about 10 minutes before you need it. So you've got to discipline yourself and give yourself time limits. Come hell or high water, I'm going to do this by 2 p.m. today. I am not going to do it past 2. By 2 o'clock today, I'm going to be finished. When you start telling yourself those things and you put your brain on notice that it only has a certain amount of time to accomplish this task, it will work faster and more efficient than you've ever seen before. Number six, keep a record of your hits and misses. This is something that I've done for years. Just like in sports where you have a free throw percentage or in baseball where you have a batting average, keep track of your batting average on decisions. If you only have five priorities and some of them come with decisions, keep track and record of that. Well, in January, maybe you decided to do X. Did that decision turn out to be good or bad? Was that a good decision you made or did you miss it? Just so you know which ones you got right and which ones gave you lessons. Most experts will agree that 70% of your decisions are going to be wrong. What does that tell you? Make sure your most important decisions and outcome fall in the 30% range. So if only 30% of the decisions you make are going to be successful, your big life-changing decisions need to fall in the 30. And if you happen to choose the wrong place to go out to eat or you pick the wrong movie to watch and that turned out to be a bad decision, let that fall in the 70 because we're all going to do it. We're all going to make a left turn on a one-way street sometime. So just make sure those kinds of things fall in the 70 and the big stuff that you really need to make decisions on uh, fall in the 30. And one thing that you'll learn, CEOs already know this, but as CEO, you make a lot less decisions 
but they're more impactful, bigger, and more important. So when you're in the lower levels of the company, you're making a lot of decisions every day. But as you rise up the organization till you get to the C-suite, you're going to make less decisions, but man, are they going to be important and impactful. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what your decision average would turn out to be over 2019's time frame? Metrics help us track our progress and our proficiency. So keep a record of your hits and misses. And finally, number seven, get a coach and possibly an advisor. I function as both coach and advisor. Get a coach advisor that you can run things past that is not emotionally connected. This is going to help you get an outer perspective and hopefully keep you from asking everybody you come in contact with about what you should do. Getting advice is smart, but resist the temptation of going to too many people or getting too many viewpoints. That can just be confusing. So decide who's going to be my advisory two or three people that I'm going to consistently go to for advice and or perspective uh, because I can trust them and they've proven to me that they can give me good, solid perspective and information. And one final thought on how to develop your priorities and decision making is when you're trying to do something new, you're not going to have 100% of the information you think you need. There are not always going to be industry reports or best practices to adhere to. So accept that you will be wrong 25% of the time and try to make as many decisions as possible followed by really strong execution and you'll be just fine. Thank you for listening to Better Than Before with Tony Richards, a business leaders podcast powered by Clear Vision Development Group. For more resources from Tony, visit clearvisiondevelopment.com. Join us next time for another episode of Better Than Before with Tony Richards.